Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Build Value by Choice. I'm your host, Nana Bonsu. I'm the president and CEO of Infinite Horizons Incorporated. Uh, we help business owners scale their businesses, especially after they've hit a plateau. Every week, we talk about a different aspect of a business that is of, um, of interest to business owners. And this week, I'm actually inviting uh, uh, on the show a person who has a vast experience in building and selling his own businesses and is now helping others. So we're going to have a two-part uh, uh, series to this uh, conversation. Today, we're just going to be focusing on, on just his journey. And then the next episode, we're going to be talking about what he's doing now based on his wisdom, his experience, and how he's you know, giving back and also helping other business owners either leverage his experience or avoid some of the mistakes that he made along the way. Uh, our guest today is Tom Gledhill, and I am going to read a little bit of his background. I mean, obviously, uh, his, his experience and background is vast, and it could take me all show to read his background, and we're not going to do that. I'm just going to give you a summary of his background. Uh, he has an impressive background. Tom Gledhill has founded, built, and sold multiple companies during his career as a business owner. He's a former mergers and acquisitions advisor and the author of two best-selling books, The Big Transfer and The Exit or XIT system, XIT Pro System. Tom has been in the trenches, founding, building, and eventually selling his small businesses. He understands what the business owner um, goes through uh, so as far as um, the stress that they have to deal with when it comes to satisfying customers and their staff, uh, meeting payroll, and also expressing concern about their future sales. He has combined his experience from building and selling companies and helping many other business owners uh, sell theirs as well. Um, you combine all of that, he's been able to develop this XIT Pro uh, system to help business owners um, increase the value of their company, thereby making more money and making their business more saleable. Tom is a U.S. Army veteran. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Maine, and he has a master's in business administration from Boston College. Tom is a certified business intermediary. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you, Nana. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Um, so, Tom, um, when I look at your profile, obviously, and you your, your, did a short clip, bio clip that I just read, you've, you've, um, you've done a lot of things. You've served your country. Um, you've, um, you have a, um, both engineering and, and business degrees, and you've built and sold uh, four companies. So could you tell us a little bit about just how you came to do what you're doing, and how you came to be where you are uh, based on your background and experience? Yeah, it really started, I think, with my parents, Nana. They, uh, they were in the hotel business, and they were uh, entrepreneurs, and they started the hotel business during the Depression. And uh, they went through quite a struggle and did very well. And I always had in my mind that I wanted to be in my own business. Uh, when I got out of the military, uh, I had worked uh, with the Nike Hercules system down at Fort Bliss, Texas. And I was an instructor there. And uh, so when I came out, uh, electrical engineers were in demand. So I majored in electrical engineering. Uh, Got involved when I graduated. I worked for an engineering company, and uh, I, I knew I didn't want to do that, quite frankly, for the rest of my life. So I started looking around, and since I had electrical engineering background, I knew something about computers. Computers were the, you know, the wave of the future, and uh, so I started thinking about what I can do. So I started researching uh, different markets to see you know, what was, what was, uh, what had a future and uh, what would use computers at least eventually. And so I, I, I decided to do some research in the medical community and, you know, and I started uh, researching medical offices, small medical offices and uh, to see what their needs were. And I actually uh, paid a medical office manager to give me a tour. And I spent a couple of days working with her. And I ended up, you know, flow charting the whole system. And, uh, and I, I, a friend of mine was a COBOL engineer, a software designer. So 
we got together and we actually developed a system. And the, the thought was to do it on a service bureau basis because uh, the, the computers were just too big at that point to even fit in a medical office. So uh, we did that and we, uh, we got a few customers and a, uh, a bigger company that actually was a service bureau uh, found out about us and they, uh, they wanted to look into getting into that business. So we came up with a, uh, a negotiated uh, deal where I would maintain uh, an equity position and I would go to work for them promoting the product. So that lasted for a couple of years and I decided that uh, I wanted to move on. So I sold my equity to that, to that outfit, that service bureau. And I started looking into another, my brother was a lawyer in a big firm. So I contacted him and I asked him about, you know, the opportunities in that market for automated administration. And so he gave me a tour. I started talking with them and they got excited about it. So I flow charted that whole system and I got this fellow involved again, the COBOL engineer, and we developed a system for lawyers. And we pretty much did the same thing as I did with the service bureau. I uh, actually joined the law firm as, a, as an administration. And uh, we started you know, using the software and selling. And uh, so I did that again for another couple of years and I sold my equity to the, to the law firm. And a friend of mine approached me and he had a, a friend that had developed a software system for civil engineers. And when civil engineers go out to survey a property, there's a lot of math involved, a lot of trigonometry involved. So we started a company and uh, we, start, we developed, we took the software that was already developed, developed a company and started promoting it, started selling it. And a small, a uh, mini computer firm approached us and they wanted to buy our software to incorporate in their system. They had a, a small handheld computer at the time and they wanted to put our software on that. So we sold the whole thing to this mini computer company. So from that point, I, uh, I joined a, I had my MBA and I got a, uh, a job with a consulting firm that did federal contracts. And they had a contract with the federal government to provide management assistance to federally funded neighborhood health centers all over the country. So I got involved in that and I was a project manager for that particular contract. And what we did mostly was update their billing system. They had real billing problems, filling out all those insurance forms and getting them in on time. And so we really started automating a lot of these neighborhood health centers. And the only vendor in, at that point that had any software for that was IBM. And they had the Series 11 at the time, which was a mini computer as compared to that big, huge, you know, computer that they started with. And uh, we started uh, installing these in these neighborhood health centers. So at, at a point in time, one of my colleagues who was very good at, uh, at he was an engineer and he was very good at programming, uh, we started talking about developing our own system because the system that IBM had at the time was pretty low on their priority list and really lacked a lot of features that we needed. So we decided we were going to leave the, the uh, consulting company and develop our own system. So we did that, I got involved in programming and uh, my colleague helped me and we, we actually developed and programmed the system and uh, we started We started in slowly. It was very difficult the first few years. We actually had to take, <clears throat> excuse me, we had to take other consulting jobs in order to put money on the table. I ended up remortgaging my house uh, to get this thing going. And 
it was pretty slow the first few years, but when IBM came up with their IBM PC, the whole thing really took off. And, um, but it was still, people didn't know, it's still a learning process on the part of the, the medical practices. Uh, at first, we, we first started out, there were big, the bigger practices that were buying our, our product, our system. And, but when the IBM PC came out, then the smaller practices started, started buying too. But it was still a, a learning process because they had to go from a paper-based system to an automated system. So uh, we got, a, we got a, uh, a boost from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, they, wanted to, <clears throat> they wanted to get involved in a system that they could, a computer system that they could give to all of their uh, clients so that they could uh, develop, send the insurance information to Blue Shield electronically. So we ended up developing that for Blue Shield. We were the first in, in the Northeast to develop this uh, process of sell, sending the electronic firms from the computer to directly to Blue Shield, where they didn't have to, the, the medical practice didn't have to fill out the forms, send the paper into Blue Shield, and Blue Shield would have to enter the information. We sent it electronically. Mm -hmm. So that really was a, was a big boost too. We ended up you know, opening offices uh, all over New England, and uh, then we started, uh, we expanded into New York and New Jersey. So when, um, when we sold, or got, got to the point where we were thinking about selling, um, because that was my end game anyway, was selling either, either going public or selling to a, a bigger company. And uh, so <clears throat> we had a couple of venture capitalists approach us wanting us to um, expand, you know, all over the country. Um, at the point I was in my fifties and uh, I decided I didn't want to do that. So we, we put the company on the market and uh, we, uh, when we, when we first sold it, we, we thought we got a good deal. We negotiated a good deal because we were looking for our employees. Right to stay with the company. We were looking for our employees to, to have a future with the company, have a career path with this company. And uh, so we made the right choice there. We thought we got a good deal. And uh, so we, uh, we sold and- um, we, How long uh, did that process take? How long did that process take to the process of that, selling? That took about a year. Okay. Took about a year. We, um, we had to develop all of, and we did no exit planning. And they, they, you know, we were fortunate. We were in the right business. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in the software business, and software was uh, was a hot market. We were in the healthcare business, and one one of the things that I did right there was I in researching, doing my research at the outset. You know, I I just decided that healthcare would be a good market to be in. Okay. And uh, in the niche would be small medical practices. So, uh, so I, I, I was right there in, the, in my business plan. In fact, my business plan that I put together was part of my MBA thesis. Oh, I see. And uh, so I just took my thesis, but you know, a business plan is dynamic. It always changes. You right. gotta go with, you gotta go with the, the plan and, and, uh, and change as you need. So, uh, so, so it's yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead Jim. Yeah, I was just gonna I was just gonna say that you know, certainly um is as you as you say this, you know, because one of the things that obviously we share in common is we both have engineering, but obviously, you know, you know, different times. But you know, I did chemical engineering, you did uh, you did electrical, I did um, MBA, you also did MBA, and uh, now now you know we we roll into you know business and becoming business owners and helping other businesses so other business owners so that's uh that's always instructive so i mean it it, it is um and i guess maybe you know having that mba background that helped you you know make sure that you did um uh, picking the right market because obviously when you were going through that exit planning was not really a thing business brokerage was not a thing so uh, I was, and, and if you are not big enough to attract the attention of investment bankers, then you pretty much were on your own. That's right. 
the uh, in the seven. Uh, this was in the seventies mm -hmm. that I started this. I, I sold it in the in the early nineties. First sold it, I think, in ninety three. So um, a lot had happened there, but we got we had a chance to really build up the uh, build up the company. But the valuation in the seventies when I sold my first three companies was was really was really unknown. You know right. the the uh, the math of, of valuation and um, and also uh, exit planning wasn't wasn't really a, a popular item. So we had done really no exit planning. Uh, it, we just we just were in the right market, <clears throat> and um, and and we did we did a lot of things right because as you know my business experience and also my uh, my MBA that I learned and we uh, so we did a lot of things right. We we hired good people. Um, we we did, we employed good systems. There were a couple of things that I wish I had done that I know now that I wish I had done, but uh, we had done a lot of things right. So we had we had a, a good value to the company. Um, and when we when we sold it, we uh, we basically started out by uh, negotiating with different uh, companies, and we didn't take the you know the first offer. We we kind of put it in a holding pattern, and uh, we started getting better offers and finally, and, and that, that's the way it worked. It wasn't like, a, here's our value of our company and, uh, and they're using the same valuation methodology, which is done now. So you, you, you start off in the same ballpark. We really, we really didn't. We had to negotiate with several different companies uh, before we got a, a price that we, uh, that we could live with. So, so yeah, I, mean, I guess I guess the the moral of that story is you want to basically you know get a couple of different candidates uh, as opposed to just you know picking one or the other and uh, you know ended up you know, end up getting lowballed. Now the other thing is you know the, the, it's a grueling process, right? I mean, it took you a year. That's a year of your life, and 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 so how does that how does that work? Because that's that's a whole different kind of full time job. Right, as you're going through this process, and in the meantime, your business is still needs to continue to run and perform. How did that, you balance that? Well, that's the difficult part. That's the difficult part is uh, is keeping the business running. In fact, making it and still improving it, still growing, while you're in a negotiating process. And it's important because the the eventual buyer is going to look at your last you know, before they sign on the dotted line. They're going to look at your last month's, uh, you know, what you did the last month or the last quarter, and that's going to play a role of whether they sign on that dotted line or not. So yeah. you've got to keep the company going. You can't just say, "Okay, I'm selling. I'm gonna," and and you go downhill, because if you have potential buyers, even if they've made an offer, you know, they haven't signed on the dotted line yet, and they can always back out. So they that that's inc that's incredibly important to keep doing that. Yeah. And the employees in this process, now you're able to negotiate good deals for them, but what was it like, you know, when did you have to like break the news to them and, and how did they take it and, you know, working with you through the process? Because there's also, you know, a mental toll on the employees, you know, as you know, this transition is happening. How long into the, into the negotiation process, you know, did the employees become aware of it and what, how did that translate into their psychology? That's a great question. And it's very important. We, it, we is a very sensitive process, and uh, our top two employees knew what we were doing, but the rest really didn't. So we had a we had a meeting, and we told them what we were going to do, and we told them we were we were looking for a company that was going to give them a larger career, a bigger career path. And okay. uh, and we actually did that. The company that we that we went with had we had good benefits. We had health benefits, we had insurance, we had we had very good benefits. And the company that bought us was a bigger company in the same market. As a matter of fact, it was a company that uh, we competed with. They wanted to move into New England, and uh, we we beat them every time we went head to head with them. So they uh, they ended up paying a good price, but they also had great benefits for their for their employees. 
And in fact, some people that have been working for us for 10 years, they worked for them with that seniority. That seniority was transferable. Oh, okay. So we, we were very careful about finding a company that would treat our people well. In fact, even provide better opportunities for them. So that's, that's, that's an important part of the whole process. Yeah, it's a win-win. Um, now, um, the, the fourth business that you sold, right? Was that that was um, that was much later. That was not in the seven. That was was that was the one that you sold in ninety three. Right. And and for that one, you used a broker. By then, I guess you know brokers were were around, so you used a broker. What was the different? Number one is what made you decide to you know, you know to use a broker, as opposed to the previous three times that you didn't. And number two, well, what was the difference uh, between doing it your own versus getting a broker? We did, we, uh, when we were thinking of selling Nano, we switched uh, accounting firms. We had a local accounting firm and we went to Price Waterhouse. Okay. And they introduced us to a lawyer uh, who became our lawyer, who was very experienced in uh, mergers and acquisitions. And as a matter of fact, at one point, and this is an important point also, he called me. And we were talking about a different subject. And he said, how are you going, how are you doing with selling your company? And I said to him, I said, you know, we're, we're doing so well. Our cash flow is fantastic. We've, we, we're introducing a new product. Everybody's excited. And he said to me, Tom, now is the time to sell. You never want to sell when it's going down or when you're stagnant. You always want to sell when you're going up. And so that, that's when we, we started looking for a broker. And uh, he introduced us to a broker who was, um, you know, emerged as an acquisition specialist, uh, came up, we talked to him and he was, we didn't like him. He uh, was very arrogant and uh, which we found a couple of these people where we talked to a couple more and they, they just were too, too arrogant for us. We, we finally found a broker who, uh, who we liked and, uh, and uh, it, it, it took really a few months for us to really put the whole thing together and, and kind of accept the fact that he, he came up with some off, off the top of his head prices. Mm -hmm. We really didn't get a good feel for the pricing process until we talked to a few buyers and uh, but this this broker was uh, we liked him. He was a hard worker. He uh, got a lot of a lot of people in to have, that we talked to. So we ended up talking to probably ten different uh, companies. Um, but then again, we had what they wanted. You know, we had software. We we had we're in the healthcare market. You know, and uh, so that that brought a, a lot of potential buyers to the table. And when you were, when you had the, so out of the 10 that you spoke with, how many went into like LOI and, and those kind of, you know, due diligence kind of phase we got to um, the real serious, you know, part yeah, of we, it? Yeah, we, we had about five letters of intent. Okay. And uh, we, again, we were, we were carefully vetting these buy, business buyers and we were looking at, you know, what their history, you know, what their future is how they treated their employees, which was critical. Um, you know, what, what their culture was. Uh, we, we, were, we were pretty experienced at that time. We, we learned a lot of what to look for in a buyer uh, from, a, from, from, we were sellers. Um, and so we got our broker helped us. And uh, so I, I would say we got five, about five letters of intent and we didn't take the highest one. We took, we took Tell us one. about that. <laughs> Why didn't you take the highest one? Because they, they didn't have the, uh, all of the other ingredients that we were looking for. The culture, the, how, the way they treated employees, their benefits. And uh, we, you know, we looked at all of that. We, we, uh, we did a lot of work on that uh, to make sure that our employees were treated well. 
when when the merger took place. No. So it's not always about the money, it's but other factors involved, so especially the human side of it. Um, I mean, so how has that uh, informed, uh, you know, because it seems like um, you're able to, you know, even if um, you didn't have all the help that, you know, in the beginning, um, you seem to have escaped some of the heartbreaks that some business owners have gone through without the help of a broker, without preparing themselves for, for exit. So, and you had mentioned that I think by the third or the fourth one, you had already begun with the exit, you know, in exit in mind. So everything that you were doing was to prepare for that. What, how has that like informed your opinion as far as when you speak with business owners and, and if, if they're not thinking about the exit, cause you know, cause you know, that's just their life and, uh, they can't think of doing anything else. Um, what would you say, um, uh, how you experience that as, um, you know, maybe change your view or your opinion uh, on that kind of uh, angle or point of view? Well, I think that, I think that when, you, when a, somebody has a small business, that they really have two things. They have an income and they have, an asset, all right? And they, you really have to look at it from that perspective. Quite frankly, I, I did, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as intense as it should have been. I always knew that I, I, had an, I was growing an asset as I grew the company because the company went from, went from zero you know, to eight figures. So I knew that I had a value there and I, that was in the top of my mind, but that's something that if I had to do it over again, I would pay more attention to that value. I, you know, I had a good income, I had good perks, good benefits, but the value was something that I should have, I should have paid closer attention to. And if I had known what I know now, and you know, knew what the buyers were, were specifically looking for. You know, I would have improved certain things. I would have better systems. All right, I, I would have had better systems. I had pretty good systems, but they could have been better. Um, so things like that that um, you know you that I could have done. Yeah. So I mean, so two main things is pay attention to value and and um, and also systems. And obviously, systems is 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 easier to to I guess un, understand and, and see. You know, if you want to scale, you need systems and processes. But the this concept of value sometimes is because it's conceptual. At least for a lot of people, it's not like hard. You know, hard hard thing like you know cash, like you know cash flow, or like even profit that you can see uh, on your PNL statement. Um, do you think that kind of factors into why, you know, this whole topic of value a lot of times is not top of mind for business owners? Well, I think that there's, there's one thing that I, when I got my, my statements from my, uh, my accountant, um, I had a profit and loss statement, I had a balance sheet. I would look at them and I didn't look at the most important one, the cash flow statement. All right, you know where the money came from, where it went. Um, I, I should have, and it, that's one of the things I that I, I wish I had done more of. Look at that cash flow statement. All right, and uh, but the uh, we were pretty good at analyzing the financials. I we had a, a an in house controller, and we developed a, a, a he we we developed we flow charted a system and we programmed it to forecast cash flow so that we always knew when we had we were going to be a have a problem with cash flow because of we forecasted it and uh so we we took a long and hard look at that sort of thing the, the financial aspect of it but the uh the other part of of selling a company is the risk that somebody is going to take on and so that's where the the good systems come in and the you know, the, the infrastructure of your company comes in so that when somebody comes in, they feel comfortable uh, looking at your company and uh, 
we, we, we had no knowledge of that, quite frankly, at the time. But we, uh, we kind of did it in, intuitively. But somebody didn't come in and say, well, you should do this and you should do that. Like, like happens now when you get, even when you go to get a good experienced broker that will come in and they'll look at your company and they'll say, you know, you really should do this and do that. You know, and it's, it's a little bit like um, preparing a house for sale, you know, staging a house. Only instead of taking two weeks, it takes two years, you know, at least to do it. So but it, it takes time. And I, I wish that I had the knowledge that I had now to do that. You know, I might have gotten a, I might have gotten a, a higher price for my company. Right. So I think the moral of the story is that, look, this is this this takes time. It's not like you, know, you wake up one day and you say, look, I'm going to sell my business. I'm going to transfer it somehow. And it just kind of happens. You know, it happens. You have to actually build up toward that eventuality. Um, and when it comes to uh, positioning your company for the exit, what do you know now that you didn't know back then? Buyers, the different okay. types of buyers. Buyers, yeah. Yeah. What What are they looking for? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the that's the critical element. Yeah. One of, one of the things I might mention uh, is that a lot of the small businesses now they don't start a business with the end in mind. Matter of fact, some of them get, get into it by accident. Some of them get into it because they have to. Uh, my father-in-law is a good example of that. He got fired from his job. And uh, I mean, this was back during the war, you know, before the war. And uh, he got fired and he needed, he, he knew his job well. And he didn't get fired because of incompetence. You know, so he started his own company doing the same thing. And uh, because he had to. Okay. Now, he didn't start it and saying, I'm going to start this company and I'm going to do an IPO. Okay. He started it to, to make a living. And he had no, he had no knowledge of the, of the value part of the company. He make, knew what he was making because he, he needed an income to live on. But the value part of it, the asset part of it, was not even in, in his head. So there were a lot of companies like that out there a lot of small businesses that have value and they don't even know it yeah. right okay so i think i think we're gonna we're gonna bring this to a close because that part two we're gonna talk about how or what are some of the things that you know business owners can do to unlock the value uh, in the business that they may not be aware of and you know you're gonna share with us some of your methodologies and the systems that you've built to help business owners do just that so certainly looking forward to that um any um, last minute kind of advice um, that you like or words of wisdom you'd like to share with the audience um, as far as um, your journey? And sure. uh, yeah. One of, one of the things that you, if you're going to get into a business is your research, you know, research the markets, you know, what, what markets are in demand. Yeah, you want something that is, that is saleable, all right? So research, do a lot of research, research your markets, research the process, and once you've got a product or a service, you've got it in place and you're starting to sell it, the main ingredient, this whole thing is perseverance. You've got to keep in there. You've got to keep going. Um, I read a book by Napoleon Hill and he said, burn all your bridges behind you because that'll, you'll have nowhere to turn. All, all right. right. I, I didn't do that completely. But I, I did to a degree, and uh, and I it was a long hard journey. My fourth company was a long hard journey, but I kept at it, and we built it. To we had offices all over the Northeast. We're doing we did very well with it. Perseverance is the thing that that makes it happen. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Tom. If people want to um, get in contact with you or follow your work, how can they do that? Well, they can go to my website, which is xitpros.com, and they can get my special report. That's a, that's a, in the navigation uh, site. Um, I have a, a free webinar that I'm distributing that uh, 
that they can get from my web on my website, xitpros.com. Okay, great. And we're going to have all that information in the show notes as well so that people can have access to it in case they don't have uh, access to a computer right now. So thank you so much, Tom, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you, Nat. My pleasure.